Uh, good afternoon, everyone. At the outset, I'd like to thank AIOS, uh, Amrita, Professor Sachdev, uh, my entire team of speakers here, my colleagues in oculoplasty, the chairpersons, and all the delegates who are listening to us online. So my to make job, it slide. Yeah. Okay. My Perfect. job is to introduce the ophthalmic considerations, and I'll keep it to the initial part, that is the diagnosis and just an overview of treatment, because I know that uh, a stage-based management is being planned right after my talk. So uh, at our institute, we have a great team of a mucormycosis task force who's been working day and night in between exenterations all across the city. We have been making documents, looking back at literature and planning to uh, make the most out of the data we are having at this point of time. So I'll touch upon the clinical spectrum, uh, basically what an ophthalmologist needs to do and how they can play a role. How do we diagnose this? And eventually an overview of the treatment. Talking about clinical uh, symptoms, the patients would often call you or they would express uh, symptoms which are quite vague and they are extended onto the entire face. So it could be periocular pain and swelling. It could be mid-facial swelling. There could be a vague headache. But what you take seriously is either blurring of vision or if you see a history of sudden onset droopy eyelid. Going beyond the eye, the ophthalmologist should quickly look into the vestibule of the nose and check whether there is any nasal discharge. Or we are need. managing today. I will let you know. Huh? Looking at the clinical signs as an ophthalmologist, uh, if you notice sudden onceptosis, which is complete and neurogenic, proptosis may be present but is usually minimal, and an ophthalmoplagia. So specifically look for movements of the eyeball. If you have any kind of facial discoloration or if fundus evaluation shows a central retinal artery occlusion, you are more clinching the diagnosis, at least clinically. Go beyond ophthalmology, look for palatal discoloration as is shown in this picture and any nasal SCAR, at least in the vestibule, which can be done with an external examination alone. For those who are called by an ENT surgeon or a multi-specialist, for an ophthalmic cancer, primarily tell the ENT guy whether there is central retinal artery occlusion in this patient. So what is the status of the vision? And they should also assess motility because this is a very good indicator whether the sinus disease is approaching the orbit or the orbital apex. Although yet to be validated, we have designed a kind of scoring system where we have club the non-specific symptoms that patient comes up with a 0.5 value to each. And the more obvious signs that we pick up as clinicians, a score of one. And we recommend that anyone who has a score above two should undergo further evaluation, which, in, which is in the form of endoscopy and imaging. So how do you go about it next? Once you have a clinical suspicion based on these findings, then you need to do a, uh, an imaging. And between MR and CT, it is obvious that MRI is more accurate in diagnosing the extent of this disease, preferably a contrast enhanced MR. But we do understand that many of these patients may have renal issues. Uh, doing an MRI uh, is not always feasible. So a CT scan may be acceptable than doing nothing at all. So what MRI or CT findings you might see, either the orbit would be entirely uninvolved or you could just see an enlargement of an extraocular muscle which is adjoining the involved sinus or you could even see focal fat streaking in the uh, orbit which is generally seen in ferromedial in these patients. Of course, more extensive involvement could be diffuse involvement of the orbit or superior ophthalmic vein thrombosis and so forth. So what I tell my colleagues uh, is that if you see this triad of ophthalmoplagia, very minimal sinusitis on the scan and CRAO, unless proved otherwise, it's a case of mucor, especially if it's a post-COVID patient. 
diagnostic endoscopy in the clinic is very essential. And for this, some of you may have to take help from your ENT colleagues, but this is a clinic-based endoscopy being done. And you can see the black or grayish SCAR, which is very classic and diagnostic of um, nuker. So if you see this, you, you are better off starting off with antifungals while you do further investigations. Next step would be uh, a microbiology confirmation, which is ideally in the form of taking a piece of that SCAR and sending it to microbiology. We currently do not know what is the role of a blind nasal swab. We are in the process of finding out this data, whether it can correlate. And even if blind swabs are able to pick up a few cases, it is still worth it in this uh, deadly situation. The final uh, histopathologic diagnosis would really uh, make it clinical, radiologic and pathological. So you would come to the next point, which is the management. So you initially had a clinical suspicion based on this triad. If the triad was positive, you could actually start amphotericin in these patients, but you still have to confirm the diagnosis with microbiology and histopathology. And beyond that point, you can broadly divide the orbital management into non-exentration options and exentration. So touching upon uh, the non-exentration as well as exentration options, just briefly, I'm not going to go into the details of the medical management, which uh, mostly our internists would help us with. But let me talk a little bit about retrobulbar amphotericin B. This is an off-label application of the drug, and there are up till now only four case reports which talk about its utility. And the dose is 3.5 milligrams per ml of AMFO combined with lidocaine in a one is to one ratio. The main concern here is neurotoxicity as a side effect. And what we do not know about this treatment is how many to inject, what are the exact indications and what to assess, whether you go by the clinical signs, which are likely to worsen post-injection or you go by radiology. So despite the uh, absence of clear-cut data here, it does play a role. Case is where there is visual potential and the sinuses have been taken care of well. So I'm just going to run a video of uh, reconstitution and injection and I hope the audio runs. Hello everyone. This video demonstrates the intraorbital amphotericin injection for orbital mucormycosis. We will look at the reconstitution and the procedure. This is a five-year-old male who has a potential in the right eye and sinus debridement has already been done. If you look at his scans, you can see that the inferomedial part of the orbit is involved and that is what would receive the amphotericin injection. So we take the amphotericin deoxycholate 50 milligram lyophilized powder vial in a 20 cc syringe. First, you aspirate sterile water for injection. Since the vial is only 10 cc, you can only aspirate 10 cc of sterile injection to begin with. Your goal would be to add 14 cc's in all. So initially add the 10 cc into the vial, the powder gets dissolved. Then you aspirate the entire amphotericin 10 cc's into the syringe. To that, add four more cc's of sterile water. This gives you 50 milligrams in 14 ml, which makes it 3.5 milligrams per ml. So here is your 14 cc is ready. You can now place it back into the vial. The vial can at the most accommodate 12 cc's, which is ready for future injections and you can store it with a date. The remaining two cc's, you can draw your first injection on the day of reconstitution. So one cc of AMFO, 3.5 milligrams, and then we also take one cc of xylocaine, 2% without adrenaline. So these two are what you need for your injection procedure. The process can be done at the bedside with sterile aseptic precautions. We are going transcutaneous in, into the inferomedial orbit. First time injecting the xylocaine, following which you give a one minute gap time, and then you inject the amphotericin in the same manner. A slow injection into the intended area based on your evaluation of the imaging. Thank you very much.
So talking uh, next about exentration, we only have data from pre-COVID era. And that still says that despite any kind of assessment and review, there has been no consensus on exactly which cases of mucormycosis should be exentrated in order to improve survival. So my personal take on these cases is uh, situations where you have a non-seeing eye, where there is panophthalmitis, the disease is progressive, you might want to consider exentration. Whereas if you have partial vision and the patient is responding to treatment, you might want to avoid exentration as much as possible. And when you do perform an exentration, uh, it is always an advantage when an ophthalmologist or an oculoplastic surgeon does it because we do the eyelid sparing, which covers the socket well and the rehabilitation is much quicker. So just to summarize, a high degree of clinical suspicion has to be there. Clinical radiologic diagnosis in the form of ophthalmoplegia, sinusitis, and CRAO can be a very classic triad in post-COVID patients. Biopsy, biopsy confirmation is needed, but if you see an SCAR, you can go ahead with antifungals along with your internus. And debridement injections and antifungals would be an overview. Retrobulbar IM4, we only have uh, to do them in select cases, and there is very limited data at this point of time. We do have a mucormycosis uh, hotline uh, for the patients who can access, and we have a team of uh, people who are working uh, to answer any questions that patients may have. Once again, a big thank you to the entire team of mucormycosis task force at our institute who is tirelessly working on this topic. Thank you.